Time magazine comes out of the Civil Rights Movement. And my work uh, first as, uh, frankly, as in the Civil Rights Movement, my late wife was African American, and our marriage was taboo because we got married before Brown versus the board. Then I was a speechwriter for Robert Kennedy when he was Attorney General, and I was heavily involved in the struggles around the 1964 Act, and then we laterally took a lot of law to the driver, and I started, I and my late wife started the services program there, and we grew up the movement. So I'm used to fighting, and I'm used to getting into fights. Uh, and, and then we started the law school to train people how to fight these fights, and we required all the law students to live with the clients for the first six weeks, because otherwise they wouldn't know, and they would think exams and paper deadlines were more important than clients. Uh, and it occurred to me that we were winning battles, but we were lo when Reagan came in, we were losing the war. We were winning some good court battles, and I thought, how do we begin to change things? And I thought, how do we begin to define all of the people whom we're helping, who have been victims of injustice, that we represent? How do we begin to empower them to, do, to redefine themselves, not as victims, but as contributors, as people who have something special to offer that we can respect? And I'm talking about children, I'm talking about teenagers, I'm talking about elderly, I'm talking about disabled, I'm talking about people on public assistance, I'm talking about all those who have been the victims of ism, whether it's women or racism, uh, or any of the other isms that we're dealing with now around same-sex marriage. You name it, there are, there are lots of isms. But there are, and how do we begin to affirm their value? Not how they're different from us, but how they can contribute to the world we want. And so, frankly, I had just had, in 1980, I had had a heart attack that blew away 60% of my heart, according to the enzyme tests. And I, I was getting good care, but I realized for me to be alive, I wanted to make a difference in somebody. For me, being alive was making a difference in somebody else's life. That's why you're here, because you want to make a difference. I think we all have a universal sense that we want our existence to matter in some way, that it's not just about us. And so that got me asking, well, we have all these people who we were putting on the scrap heap because there was a recession there, we were declaring the losers, and all of these unmet needs, and I thought, why can't we invent a new kind of money that would do that? And uh, at that point, people were sure that my heart attack had affected other organs. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, so I went about it, and I thought, well, this is consistent. And sort of most of you may have heard of babysitting movies, where you put in an hour babysitting for somebody else, and get somebody else in that babysitting. And I thought, this is so simple. I need, uh, and my son said, you better go to the London School of Economics because you know don't know any economics, Dad. Uh, well, they've also said I'm the wrong person to invent time banking because I don't understand time and I don't understand banking, but that's another, that's between me and my son. But anyway, uh, I'll simply say that when I went there, the critical issue was how could you issue a currency without price? And I looked at, because I did not want to transmit the same value system because money is truly devalued to anything that was there. That was just, I mean, that was so starkly apparent. We're talking now in the 70s and 80s. And the battles over the comfortable work were now were then going on. And I came to understand that there are two kinds of value, and this is what made it theoretically possible as I debated it. There's the value that, let's say, that we all, even economists, that see teachers take lower pay because of the psychic value they get of feeling they're doing something important. They could earn more in the market doing other things. So there's an intrinsic value, your sense of self-worth is affirmed, and then there's the extrinsic value of what you can buy with it. Well, the currency that I developed was a currency that said, I want to affirm the intrinsic value of what it feels like to be a human being who matters to other human beings in a way that I can look at and say, 
I've earned a hundred time credits making a difference in other people's lives. Now you've got to understand what price does. Price does exactly the opposite. Price values what is scarce. So if it's scarce, it's valuable. If it's abundant, it's cheaper. If it's really abundant, it's worthless. Which means that everything that brings us here is worthless. Everything that our desires to make a difference in the world, no market value. Nobody is paying you minimum wage or higher for the work that you're doing coming here. Nobody is paying you if you listen to a lonely person to share their problems. Nobody is paying you if you mentor a kid that needs help with homework. Nobody is paying you if you give a ride to the airport for somebody out of caring. Nobody paid the people to do the sit-ins in the civil rights movement, to protest apartheid, to try and campaign for endangered species, or to try and deal with, car with the carbon footprint we need. In other words, the work that the market pays does not value is caring work, mentoring work, civic engagement, social justice work, environmental work, and the preservation of cultural traditions. Those only happen to be the things that undergird civilization and that have enabled the species to survive and evolve. But we devalue everything that has enabled us to build the kind of culture and civilization. I thought maybe, just maybe, we ought to start valuing that. You know, Gandhi, I happen to know, was a lawyer, but I don't know how good a lawyer was. Mother Teresa was a teacher, but I don't know how good a teacher she was. I'm told that Jesus was a carpenter, and I really don't know how good a carpenter he was. And frankly, I really don't care, because the things we care about, we don't value. You're here because you value something that's not about market price. And so what time banking is about, is about saying, how do we begin to create a currency that not only values, but that begins to tap the vast capacity of people here in community. Now, I'm going to simply say that there is somebody here who knows how to do shopping. Somebody here knows how to do nails or hair or wallpaper or change tires or just do favors for people or clean up trash or do some community gardening. The kinds of things we need to rebuild community are critical. But we live as strangers and we don't know and now the message is don't trust a stranger. And the message that the right wing particularly preaches is be afraid. Be afraid, be afraid, and it's all about fear. So look at what the GDP now represents. It represents monetary transactions. So the more prisons we build, that's growth. The more we put people in nursing homes, that's growth. The hero of the GDP is somebody who's undergoing terminal chemotherapy and a divorce simultaneously. That's really what we want to promote around here, right? So all I'm saying is that what, when I invented time banking, I thought we need to do something that values what we all can do. Now, I also looked at the fact, frankly, that it takes money to run a time bank because somebody who's a coordinator has the unfortunate habit of needing to eat. Now, we haven't yet found the species that doesn't. So until we do, we've got to understand that it's like that building social, new kinds of social institutions can be done, I'm saying, like a social Prius. They run on a thin stream of money and a large stream of psychic energy. But they do need that thin stream of money, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I am saying that a Prius will go further than a car that's just running on gas.